record. All right, here we go. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are Richmond American University London, and this is our affordability and financial aid webinar. My name is Victoria Yepis Taylor, and I am the Assistant Manager of Operations for Admissions. I've got my email address right there on the front slide. If any questions come up that are a little bit more personal, which a lot of times they can be with financial questions, you can always send us an email tonight, tomorrow, you know, or we're happy to schedule a call too. But for now, let's let's get started here and get into uh, get into some of the details. So this is the question that we're all here trying to figure out. Answer, can I afford an international education in London? Well, all I can do is provide you with all the facts, all the figures, all the information to allow you to make that assessment, make that decision for you, your family, all of that, and um, and, and see if, if this is something that makes sense for you. So first I start with the most simple, just basic terminology, basic vocabulary tuition. I'm sure you've heard that a lot. I'm sure you've had questions about that. Parents, guardians, everyone has questions about tuition and it's important, an important element. Uh, so I just want to define terms here a little bit. So when we say tuition, tuition is a term that refers to the yearly cost of attendance at Richmond. So this is a lot of times um, students are asked if there's this kind of separate fees to enroll uh, and and no, that the tuition is the fee that you know it's all wrapped in there um, but it is important to highlight what tuition isn't so that you're kind of doing the math you know, doing the math right so tuition does not include things like the cost of housing food travel your visa if you need one or your daily expenses so tuition is the cost to attend the school which I think is, is pretty universal, but I, I do know, especially in the U.S., some schools do have, there's just different, they just, uh, we all use the vocab a little differently and, and have different systems set up. Uh, another element that we're familiarizing ourselves with today, and maybe you are familiar already, but it's all right if not, is uh, currency and conversion rates. So in the U.K., they have the U.K. pound sterling, and obviously in the U.S., we've got the U.S. dollar. Being that Bobby and I represent the U.S. Admissions Office, this presentation does come from a perspective of a student that is applying from within the United States. If you are applying from outside of the United States, uh, you, you could still gain some get value from a lot of the info that we're providing. A lot of it is universal, but there are some elements that are very specific to um, to uh, arriving from the U.S. So if, if, if you feel like you're confused or uncertain, we can always connect you with the UK recruitment team if, if that makes more sense for you. Uh, the other thing here, I've got a little, some symbols, the currency symbols. You see the pound symbol, GBP, the little L with a little line through it, and then the US dollar, the S with the line through it. So if this is your first time, getting used to currencies, that's fine. I've broken it down here on the right side just to give you some examples of, of ways of thinking about it. So one way to think about it is that one UK pound is equivalent to about a dollar and 27 cents. So about a dollar and a quarter. So a pound is, is a little bit stronger than a dollar, about 25, 27%. And now this can vary a little bit. Like you'll see this one I pulled um, is about a month ago. So currency exchange rates can vary slightly, but the whole point of today is just kind of to go over the general idea. So you, you can start getting familiar with that. If thinking about pound to dollar in that direction doesn't make sense, another way to think about it is if you had 100 US dollars, it'd be equivalent to about 78 pounds, 78, 70 pounds, so about 80, 80 pounds. So they're just about, you know, almost 20, 20 pounds off or 25% uh, if you're coming from the other direction. Uh, and this can vary a little bit, but you know, you get the general, general idea. If you ever have questions about currency, you can always, uh, you can Google it all the time. I, I do that every once in a while just to make sure I've got, you know, that I'm thinking right. Or you can go to this website, xe.com. Uh, they have a live foreign currency exchange rates as well. So a number of different ways to, uh, you know, get, get familiar with it. I think once you kind of get the hang of it, you start to, you're like, oh, okay, it's, you know, it's about a buck and change kind of. Um, but 
uh, important to consider. And you don't want to mix, you know, think that you're thinking in pounds and, and it's, um, you know, you don't want to be off by that much. So you want to make sure you're thinking about the right uh, currency. <clears throat> All right, so what is Richmond tuition? Undergraduate tuition is £15,645 per year. So £15,645, UK pounds, equivalent to about, uh, or approximately 19880 so we could say equivalent to about 20000 US dollars. Um, so if you've noticed, if, you've, if you're familiar with Richmond and you've checked out our site in the past, you may have noticed that we have had a change in tuition. Uh, in the past, we had a U.S. dollar rate for U.S. students, and we've decided to completely revamp that system. And now all international students, U.S. included, their tuition is in U.K. pounds and is the 15645 Reasons for this change, one, affordability, um, comparing us to other U.S. institutions. We think that this uh, tuition rate makes us quite competitive. Also transparent. Uh, it's a straightforward tuition rate, no hidden fees. The tuition is the tuition. And clarity, um, once again, just that it's uh, a very straightforward um, amount. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about it and, and why we're focusing on it today. So affordability, why is that why is that important? Well, according to uh, Fidelity Investments, they had a, in 2021 a college savings and student debt survey, and they found that four out of 10, so 40% uh, 40 of high school students rated cost of attendance as the most important factor in choosing a college. That's pretty significant, 40%. And then I imagine another 20, 30% of students, maybe it wasn't the number one factor, but I'm sure it was in the top, you know, top two or three. So we know that uh, affordability is, is an important element to consider. And I think that's great. This is the time to be doing that. Uh, another way to be thinking about this is if you're comparing our tuition to, um, for example, like seeing this chart on the other side of the screen here by College Board Trends in College Pricing and Student Aid 22. So if you're comparing us to, for example, I'm from Florida, you know, if you're comparing us to like a full ride to a state school or something like that, then it is, it is tough to be a little more competitive. But if you're comparing us to perhaps a four year public or a four year out of state university, you would see that our tuition would fall right in between there. And, um, that private um, nonprofit four-year universities can can be almost uh, almost double the tuition cost. Now we do acknowledge that there are additional costs to consider when studying abroad and studying in London, and so we'll go into that uh, into those details. But I just kind of wanted to provide some context here of. Um, it, it all depends on what you're what you're comparing us to. So um, I, I speak to a lot of parents and students who say, "Wow, like that's a great tuition. That that you know that sounds that totally aligns with what we're what we're thinking." And I, I work with some students who that that is a little bit more of a challenge, and they do have to figure out how they're going to do this. Um, you know, does it make sense for them? And that's what we're here to do today. All right, another element that can help reduce that tuition cost would be our merit-based scholarships. So all of our applicants are considered for our merit-based scholarships. They are strictly GPA-based. There is no additional application needed. And this automatically renews as long as you maintain uh, the, you, you meet the criteria of maintaining your status, uh, your GPA, your standing as a student involved in the community, things like that, uh, then, it, then the scholarship does renew. So we have two scholarships. We have the Liberal Arts Excellence Award and we have the the, uh, Liberal Arts International Attainment Award. The Excellence Award is offered to students with a GPA, oops, 3.5 and above, and that's 3,000 pounds per year. And then we've also got the International Attainment Award that is 3.0 to right under 3.5, and that one is for 2,000 pounds a year. So um, these scholarships can be a reduction in your tuition costs. I've gone through some examples here to um, kind of help wrap our heads around it. I do not claim to be a math expert, so I do love to have the visuals and just break it down, give you examples and exchange rates and as, as simple as the math can be. Uh, so undergraduate scholarship example. So for the first one, let's say you have a GPA of 3.0. And um, so you take our tuition, 
subtract the 2,000 pound scholarship, and that brings you to 13,645. Now, again, you got to think in US dollars, that usually helps us, you know, get familiar with amounts. So that's equivalent to about 17,000 US dollars. Uh, another example, if you had um, perhaps a 3.7 GPA, then you would get the International Excellence Award um, that is valued at uh, um, that is valued at the, sorry, <laughs> this is valued at the 3,000 pounds. And then uh, that would bring tuition down to 12,645, which is equivalent to about 16,000 US dollars. So here's two examples. If you have any questions about um, scholarships offerings, how they're calculated, uh, we, we I, I think it is pretty straightforward, but all of our students are very unique, very different. Um, you know, maybe they're coming in with transfer credits. They're coming in with some, uh, some AP, some community college, and, and kind of want to know how it's going to be calculated. And so that's something we can connect with our UK team to uh, make sure that you're receiving the the scholarship award that that you think you've earned and, and that you deserve, or explaining to you, you know, how they've made the calculations. I do know once a scholarship is offered, it typically it's it does stay at that offering, even if by the end of the school year you um, perhaps like picked up your grades or something like that. It's 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 when you apply is is when they are um, evaluating that transcript, that GPA, and and evaluating you for scholarships. All right, so a little bit more about uh, transparency and clarity. So we've got our straightforward tuition rate, as I mentioned, no additional fees. And the next step is to provide a clear outline of additional costs to consider. This would include the visa, travel, accommodation, books, and daily expenses. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, but um, first, really quick, just in case I have any graduate students, any postgraduate uh, contenders uh, joining us today, want to include their tuition rates as well. So you can see here there's variations a little bit program to program. So make sure you're looking at the right program. This is also on our website. Uh, and then I did one, since I didn't want to flood this whole page with conversion rates. I just wanted to give you an idea. So like for our MBA, for example, 17,325 pounds, uh, equivalent to about 22,000. And that's for the whole program. Um, so the other programs, which are some are lower than 17, some are higher. That's another reason why I picked this amount. So you know, okay, about equivalent, you know, these other programs are going to be about equivalent to, uh, you know, if, if 17 is 22, then, you know, something that costs less than that, 16, uh, like the MSc International Business would be maybe around 17, 18,000 uh, or something that's a little bit more like the luxury brand management. That one's going to have a little bit higher, maybe 24, 25 US uh, dollars. But you can punch these into any uh, currency calculator to, to get the rate. Just keep in mind that it does change. It does vary slightly day to day, uh, but that's all a part of international uh, business. As well, we do have scholarships for our graduate students. We have, um, for students that have a 3.3 GPA, that's a 10% reduction, uh, 3.7 GPA, 15%. And if you join us previously for your bachelor's uh, or for a visiting study abroad program, you can get a 20% reduction, which is very exciting. All right, so now we carry on, like I was saying, two costs uh, to consider. Uh, one of the big costs to consider would definitely be the visa, the visa application, the visa process. So the visa application is 490 UK pounds. This is a one-time application. So all fees have to be considered during this one time, paid during this one time, because you won't be, um, you, it's not like um, another country where they have you renew it every year. This is a one-time, one and done. So. 490 pounds equivalent to about 622 US dollars. That is the application cost. Now there's another cost involved with applying for your visa, and that is the immigration health surcharge. 
IHS. This is your health care, your health coverage that covers you while you are a student in London. And this is £776 per year. I do want to highlight this part because you may, if you search online reading about the visa process, they're always making updates and changes. And so there have been updates to uh, the costs of uh, the surcharge and I believe the application a little bit too. So you want to make sure that you're looking at the most up-to-date info. Um, this is the most up-to-date as of you know today's presentation. I think this update was made recently, so I don't anticipate any um, new ones, but um, I just want to make sure there's a lot of uh, student visa resources out there, but you do want to make sure you know what date um, that information was published. Of course, the UK uh, visa and immigration webpage is a, you know, would be the best place. Um, and then we uh, refer to that as well. So we would be up there too. Uh, so 776 pounds per year, equivalent to about 986 US dollars per year. And it is charged for all years of expected study at the time of application. So I have an example here because, you know, I like to see the figures and uh, get an idea. So an example, uh, we've got the application fee here, 776. And then I'm just for this example, just to keep the math simple, I'm going to say you're a new incoming freshman with no transfer credits. You're, you're going to do your full four years in London with Richmond. So times four, that brings us to 3,104. And then I added the application fee, 490, and that brought me to 3,594. So that is equivalent to uh, about 4,500, 4,566 US dollars. Now, uh, keep in mind that the IHS fee, they cover, it's based on the length of your visa, and then it also covers uh, a little bit of time prior to arrive, um, not arrive, a little time prior to the start of the program, and a wrap-up period after the program as well. And so all that time needs to be covered by the healthcare. Um, even if you have care in the US, it's you, you, this is a part of the visa application. There are very few, very, very few uh, exceptions to this rule. But if you think you have one of them, feel free to reach out and we can look into it for you. Uh, and then I have this website here, Immigration Health Surcharge, uh, where you can put in when your start term will be, when your program will end, and they'll do the math for you. Uh, because maybe you have uh, a different set of circumstances. Maybe you won't be joining us for a full four years. Maybe you're a grad student, you're coming for a full year or whatever it is. So it's difficult for me to do the math for everybody because everyone has a couple, you know, there's a couple different routes you could be going. Um, but I just wanted to kind of pick one of the longer maximum amounts. So you kind of, uh, you know, you get the idea. Now, if you want more information about the visa process, which who doesn't? right? Uh, if you want more information about the visa process, we're going to have a visa webinar uh, March 7th uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, East Coast. So same time, same place. If you're here now on a Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern, what is that for Pacific? Um, then that is, that's where we'll be. But again, if you missed that, feel free to reach out. We'll get, we'll get a recording to you, or we're always happy to have a call and, and go into, um, you know, go into more detail if, if, um, if you have concerns, questions, anything like that. All right, so another financial element to consider would be uh, something called the financial requirement. Sometimes they call it financial maintenance. It's the concept that the UK government wants to know that you have enough funding to support yourself while you're in the UK. We can all debate how much a person needs to support themselves, but we don't have to because the UK has come up with a number. They've calculated that a student needs about 12,000 pounds, 12,006 pounds. Uh, and they did this by looking at sort of a first year, about nine months, and they calculated that a student needed about 1,334 pounds a month to support themselves. And when you start thinking about all the daily expenses, you know, that, that amount sounds, um, you know, sounds about right. Um, so 12,006 pounds equivalent to about 15,000 US dollars. Um, now, due to something called the differential evidence uh, requirement, there's a number of countries that are considered low risk nationals and they do not need to submit this financial evidence to Richmond or during uh, the initial visa application, but 
This evidence could be requested of you later in the visa application process, not by us, but by the UK visa and immigration. So that's why we're talking about it now so that you are prepared. So, um, and this is British nationals, US passport holders, and a number of other countries, you can check them all out. And this is the country where your passport is from. So being that we're low risk nationals, this is not something we have to submit, but we do need to be prepared for. So if you were requested to show this evidence, it could be shown through a bank statement of a student or a parent. Um, it does need to have been in that account for about 28 days prior to, another reason why we talk about it now. Uh, if you decide to use a parent's account, then uh, they will request a copy of the birth certificate and a letter, letter from the parent stating that, um, you know, I allow these funds to, to go towards supporting my student while they're abroad. Again, super rare uh, for a U.S. passport holder to be requested all this information, but let's be ready for the super rare. Um, and yeah, you'd be contacted right by the UK VI. And yeah, again, if any questions come out of any of this, everyone is super unique, has super, um, you know, different backgrounds and things like that. So we're happy to dive into everyone. Uh, if you are a UK passport holder, then definitely encourage you to join us with that passport so you don't have to apply for the visa. All right. Other costs to consider. So another cost to consider is housing. So this year, our partner, our housing partner has been IQ Haywood House. Um, we are looking at a number of uh, additional partners as well for the next coming year, but I have their figures here so that we can familiarize ourselves. This is all about familiarizing, familiarize ourselves with costs. Um, students are not required to stay in uh, Richmond with our partners, but um, we do encourage it just for the extra support uh, and to be with fellow Richmond students. But even if you want to look at other providers, at least you can start with ours and get familiar with the amounts and then compare those rates to others and see what makes the most sense for you. So, for example, uh, at IQ Haywood House, now these rooms are, um, every student gets their own room and their own bathroom. And then they have a shared kitchen and living room space with about six to eight other students. Or there's also um, private uh, studio options that are available too. So it just depends on what you would prefer. So let's look at some options here. So they rank their housing. They have um, gold, silver, bronze, and then the amounts range from about, let me see what the lowest is, around 331 a week to about 500 pounds a week. So I just picked for this, for example, um, I just went with like a medium line of about 400 pounds a week, equivalent to about 500 US dollars. So you can start thinking about housing, okay, about 500 US dollars a week. So it's about 2000 US dollars a week. Week. So that is something to, um, you know, that is an element to consider that's outside of tuition, but certainly an important uh, part of the calculations and life in London and with Richmond. Uh, one thing to say about our partners, perks of staying with our partners would be that you're with fellow students, you've got like the hall director, you've got that extra student affairs support, um, and, and Richmond has negotiated a contract length with the providers. Um, for example, with IQ, uh, it's a length that aligns a little bit better with our academic calendar than some other providers. Uh, and I don't think I mentioned that the reason universities like us, like Richmond, we partner with these third party professional providers, because London is, uh, you know, a location where real estate is quite, quite at a premium. So these providers have, um, you know, they've secured the housing, and then we partner with them. Uh, another neat thing about going with our partners is that it also connects you with the larger London student population, because you've got some of our students, but then you've got students from other London universities there as well. And I think that's really neat, because London is such a fantastic student city. So to meet other students, especially like this, in, in the, like an international housing location is, is very exciting. But if you have questions about housing, you can check out our accommodation 
page as well on our, our website. Uh, we have our partners listed. We have alternative third party providers. And then at the bottom, we have like a classic apartment search uh, websites as well. But of course, for new incoming students, definitely encourage uh, going with some kind of third party professional student dorm just so you can get the lay, lay of the land. All right, other costs to consider. So we got this handy chart here. Um, it kind of, we've broken it in two columns, one sort of lower cost, one higher, just to try to give you the middle, the max, or the lower and the maximum, and, and likely most students would kind of fall somewhere in the middle. So the number one element, of course, like we said, housing, um, and, and it's based on the three-week agreement, a three-week, 36-week <laughs> agreement. Sometimes students will say to me that they found a uh, lower weekly rate with another provider, which is totally possible, but a lot of times those providers do require students to sign up for like a 52-week or 54-week agreement or something like that. So if you are um, completely content with, with staying over the summer and have no problem with that, then it's not an issue. But I just want to make sure that students understand, since we're looking at math and numbers, that uh, the, the weekly rate might not be as much of a deal if it's spread over, you know, an extra 20 weeks that you don't intend to, to be in London. But, you know, whatever makes the most sense for you. So that's the top item we got listed there. So we ranging from around 1,100 pounds to about 1,500 pounds. Food, another item to, to consider here. Um, textbooks, this is one point I always like to highlight. Um, I think there's a part of the culture of going to college in the United States is, you know, every class has a textbook and it's a very expensive book and you have to get the book and book, book, book. Uh, not that classes don't use books in the UK, but I find that a lot of professors use uh, multiple sources. So they'll, they, you know, maybe they'll send you to the library to check out this book, but then they'll also send you links. They'll send you to this academic journal. They'll send you this video. Um, so it was just less, um, books were never such a huge uh, fee to consider, but good to keep in your, um, you know, when you're trying to budget, good to keep that amount in mind. Um, and also, I personally, you know, found a lot of different, uh, you know, secondhand book, textbook options and things like that. So um, it really, and a lot of times you can return those textbooks if, if you've kept them in good shape to uh, those secondhand textbook providers. So um, definitely uh, a few ways to, to reduce, uh, to reduce those costs. Other items to consider, laundry, right? If your parents aren't doing it, you might have to pay for some laundry here. Uh, your phone, um, you know, there's many affordable plans, but still an amount to consider. And then clothes, travel, edu um, entertainment. This one, this category is so difficult to estimate because... Uh, you know, you could be, it, it could, uh, the month we're looking at could be the fall break and, and you could have a really uh, cool getaway planned uh, or, or it could be a month, uh, you know, closer to exams when, when you're kind of just staying in and, and preparing. But in any case, you know yourself better, a little better than we do, so you can kind of figure out where you would fall here. Uh, another resource here, UCAS has a uh, budget calculator. Last I checked it, um, they were doing an update on it, so I'm not sure if they're done yet, but there's a number of different budget updater, uh, budget calculators that you can check out if you still feel like you need a little extra help, just making sure that you're thinking about everything. All right. All right, a few words here from our, our fearless leader, President uh, Dr. Phil Deans. Uh, so he says, just a little bit on the tuition and the transparency, not only are we offering greater transparency, but an education at Richmond, which provides students with excellent value for money through our applied approach to liberal arts. So yes, we are a liberal arts university, which I know speaking to a mostly US-based audience, liberal arts is, is kind of uh, standard, but in the UK, a lot of times they do not follow that um, that system. So it, it is something that makes us special and unique. And it is part of the element that makes us the American university that we are, is that we do believe in, um, you know, you, you pick your major, you pick your program, you pick your focus, but then you also study um, other topics uh, as well as general education topics um, so that you're, by the time you graduate, you're a well-rounded uh, individual. All right, bye, Dr. Phil. All right, we get to talk about FAFSA. Oh my goodness, everyone's been going a little crazy about FAFSA. I know they, um, they've, uh, they updated their application and they've been, um, 
So there's been, you know, some delays and things like that with them. But uh, as far as Richmond goes, you're, you're perfectly fine. Um, if you need to fill out your application, all eligible students and guardians can apply. Just gotta make sure, yeah, that you're eligible. And, um, and important to keep in mind that there are no need-based offerings or grants uh, that are available to Richmond students. Um, for an example, like the Pell Grant, Richmond is located outside of the U.S., and one of the rules of the Pell Grant is that the university be within the U.S. So, unfortunately, we would love to, but unfortunately, those are the Department of Education rules. Um, and as well, no need-based offerings. We offer our merit-based scholarships, uh, and then students can use FAFSA for the parent and student loans. If you need to uh, complete your FAFSA app and include our codes, we can get the info. You can either do it by code or you can fill in our name, but I find some students have trouble searching for us, so the code is the best way to go, G10594. Uh, if you have any basic questions about FAFSA, I'd encourage you to email us. I'll, I'll post my email again at the end of the presentation. Um, but if you've got a super serious FAFSA issue that you don't think we can help with, you can reach out to our Assistant Dean of Financial Aid, Jason Elliott. Um, typically, if, if it is a more of a basic admissions question, he will send it back to our office. Uh, but if it is something that he needs to look in a little further for you, maybe you've used a little bit of FAFSA funding before and, and there's something he needs to look into, uh, then that there's his contact info right there. All right, and a little bit about the timeline of just how things work. So as I mentioned before, um, you know, they, they opened the app a little bit later in December instead of October, uh, which I know for some schools um, uh, did uh, does really uh, impact their financial aid schedule. Uh, for Richmond, much less so. Um, typically, our loan information uh, will be going out um, usually around the end, end of this month going into March is, is when we would start to use that info. Here's a little bit of a, a timeline here. So if you qualify, you complete the application. And um, what happens is our Office of Financial Aid, they issue loan award letters. These letters uh, let students know uh, exactly how much loan funding is available. And if you are happy with the amount, you sign, you return it to financial aid. You're also welcome to cross out amounts if the loan offerings are higher than what you need. Um, Jason in financial aid, he has a kind of formula that he uses to calculate the maximum loans that Richmond um, students can use. But if you've got other funding options or you just don't want to take out that big of a loan uh, or you just want to cover tuition with it or what have you, then that's fine. You can cross it out and put in a lesser amount. Um, and then once a, a loan letter is returned, signed and returned, students do have to go, it's kind of a part two that's included on the letter. So you can you just got to read that loan letter to know. But um, the next step is to go back onto the FAFSA website and to complete the loan counseling and sign the MPN, the Master Promissory Note. Uh, these two activities can feel kind of similar. Um, so sometimes students will do one, but they haven't done the other. So you just want to make sure that loan counseling and MPN is complete. If parents are getting a loan, then they have to complete the MPN as well. Both of these items are just making sure that students understand the responsibility that is involved with taking out student loans. Uh, then the final step is that the Dean of Financial Aid will issue a loan confirmation letter. This completes the process. Whew. We're almost there. We're getting there, I swear. All right. A little bit more of defining terms because I know there's a lot of new terms here. So for student loans, there's two kinds through FAFSA. There's the direct subsidized loan and there's the direct unsubsidized loan. So what does this mean? So direct subsidized loans for independent and dependent undergrad students. And the subsidized means that the interest on the loan is paid by the federal government while the student is in school. So subsidized interest paid by federal government. On the flip side, direct unsubsidized loans uh, for independent and dependent undergraduate students and graduate students, uh, interest does accrue while the student is in school. So that's the little differences there. The student loans for undergraduates are smaller loans because students don't have that large of a credit history, but um, but they are available to, to take advantage of. So then for parents, we have the direct parent plus loan. And this is for parents of dependents 
uh, and this would cover, it, it's calculated to cover the full cost of attendance. Um, it, it, parents are due to, um, are subject to a credit check and students, uh, parents can ask to defer repayment while the student is in school and for up to an, an additional six months after graduation. The final kind of loan, the direct grad plus loan, graduate plus loan for independent graduate students to cover the full cost of attendance minus any other aid or funding could be subject or subject to a credit uh, rating check. And again, students to uh, begin paying within uh, six months after graduation. So if this is the first time you're seeing all these terms, I know it can be a lot, um, but you will start to, you know, the more you go into loans, uh, these terms start popping up more and more and then you kind of, you get familiar with them. So specifically, how much are these loans uh, for? So you can kind of take a look at this chart and see if you are bringing some transfer credits in with you, then maybe we need to do a transfer credit evaluation first for you to know exactly where you would fall. But again, we're here for general ideas and familiarization, so here we go. Uh, for undergrads who are dependents, uh, so the students under 25, um, for example, the freshmen, it's a 3,500 uh, subsidized and a 2,000 unsubsidized loan, totaling 5,500. Now, if you've got some transfer credits, a sophomore, you see it goes up a little bit, a uh, thousand, and then junior and senior, it goes up a little bit more. Um, if we have independent students uh, over 25, or if they've uh, gone through becoming independent uh, other, through other paths, um, then you see the amounts are a little bit higher for the unsubsidized loans. Finally, we've got graduate loans here, and it's the 20500 unsubsidized for, um, they say up to two years, but our, our undergrad program is, uh, well, if it starts in fall, it's one year. If it starts in spring, it's about 16 months. Um, so there is an opportunity to take out another loan before the spring start program ends. But anyway, um, yeah, you can, this chart is also on our financial aid page, um, or, you know, always happy to send it to you, discuss it with you, anything like that. But these are the amounts for the student loans. All right, we are almost there. So, and then I'll go check out what's going on in the chat there. Um, so I just want to have a little sample here of what a loan letter looks like. So you kind of, it, it doesn't look weird, new or scary when, when you, when you, if you receive one, if you request one. So um, this is a piece of the letter letting you know the next page has the loan amounts on it. If a student wants loans, they sign and return it to Jason Elliott, and then you keep a copy for yourself. Uh, and then it instructs students to go back on to the studentaid.gov and complete the master promissory note, complete the entrance counseling, and um, you know notify financial aid of the loan amounts. You do that by returning the, the loan letter. Uh, parents, um, they also have to apply and, and get a satisfactory credit check and sign the MPN. So there's a few stages to each part of, um, you know, for the loan process and for the visa process. Um, so, you know, always feel free to check in with us. And um, if you're concerned, am I, you know, am I moving at the right pace? Am I ahead? Am I behind? You know, things like that. There's, I find a lot of the just onboarding process in general is a lot of hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. Uh, and so I, I think at least in the meantime, when we're in the wait periods, you can be familiarizing yourself and preparing so that when it is time to move forward, you, you can strike. All right. And um, a little bit more info pulled from the loan letter. So um Student educational loan amounts are per year, but they are dispersed each semester. So if you take, for example, if you take out a $10,000 parent loan, for example, uh, that is divided over a fall and a spring intake. So that means that a student 5,000 is applied to uh, fall and then 5,000 would be applied to spring. So if you need to make sure that, uh, you know, if you're planning to get a little bit of a refund, if you want some of, you know, if you're taking more loan out than is needed to cover tuition and, um, you know, you want to use that excess for your student to support themselves while they're in the UK, um, then that's totally fine. You just want to keep in mind that split of fall and spring. Um, so these are the maximum on the loan letter. It's the maximum loan amounts that are determined by FAFSA, the Federal Direct Loan Program, and our cost of attendance. 
Uh, signing the MPN does not commit you to taking the loan. Interest calculations are based on disbursement dates and federal loans can always be repaid without penalty. Uh, important to note, student loans, even when you've completed the entire process, a lot of times students think, oh, I, I finished the loan process. My loan has already been sent to Richmond. No, student loans are dispersed to the university when courses, when classes begin. So um, it isn't till, you know, end of August, September that those loans are dispersed. I mentioned that just to make sure that, again, when we're keeping amounts in mind, funding, things like that, that, um, you know, a student has enough money um, prior to that loan dispersing to, you know, make sure that they're okay, make sure housing is sorted out. Uh, some housing providers are familiar with loan letters and are, are willing to wait for those disbursements. Other housing providers may want a student to sign up for um, like a payment plan, for example, even though I know sometimes students are frustrated by this because they say, I'm going to have the whole amount once my loan disperses. Why do I have to sign up for a payment plan? But I think it's just how some of these different uh, housing providers work. But the main point of all of that is to say that just make sure whoever you're working with for housing that you understand what the rules are, what the disbursement, when do they want the full payment for housing and all of that. Um, Let's see, uh, the amounts listed are subject to change if award eligibility changes, you receive additional aid, or if you change, uh, if there's a change in other circumstances. All right, so here's the, the key part that I wanted you to see. So this is just an example here. Let's see, so the student scholarship is listed, uh, their subsidized loan is listed unsubsidized, and then you see this parent plus loan. And I know you may be saying, well, Victoria, I thought tuition, you said it was 15,000 pounds. Why, why is the parent plus loan 42? Um, that's because in addition to tuition, uh, our Dean of Financial Aid had to also include cost of attendance, just anticipated expenses. And so that's how he's come up with that figure. And so that's the maximum that you can take out. You do not have to take out that amount. You can, as he says here, simply cross out and write in the amount you would like to take out. But this is the max. They want to make sure that any student and, and parent that uh, plan to take out loans, the, the loans will support and cover a student for uh, for their studies. Um, and then it tells you here in bold as well to sign your MPN uh, afterward. And um, here are the rules for, uh, you know, maintaining the, these uh, offerings, maintaining good standing. Um, what else? Uh, maintaining a 2.0 GPA or better. Um, act in the best interest of the, you know, just kind of be a, a good upstanding citizen in your university community. Uh, but if, if you have questions about any of these points, definitely let us know. Oh my goodness, questions. All right, I've been seeing the chat go up a little bit. Um, let me just go back to the very start and see. I know Bobby might have jumped in too. Uh, okay, he's got the registration for the visa webinar and housing options, nice, 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 okay. Uh, do these options apply for students who will be in Leeds versus London? Oh, okay, so if you're talking about Leeds, I imagine you're talking about our RIESA program. Um, so a lot of the general concepts, the visa amounts, things like that, will housing options, uh, well, since the example I used was from a housing provider in London, housing options may be a little bit different, but I imagine similar rates or maybe a little, yeah, I, I would imagine they'd be a, a similar. Um, if you are part of the RISA program, then I think Sarah Crossland would be uh, the best contact. I imagine you might be already in touch with her, uh, but if not, let me know. We can get you all connected. Um, oh, I should read what Bobby says first. Uh, this list is for housing, okay, for London Housing Project. Right, right, okay. Um, we got one more question here. How does VA have to apply to tuition? Can students use both VA disability benefit and post-911 or can they only utilize one? Um, so this is a good example of a, uh, if, if one parent used some of their, can they da, 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 da. Um, so, um, Jason Elliott, our Dean of Financial Aid, he would be the main contact. What he would need would be the copy or copies of the COE, Certificate of Eligibility, and he can review that, check in his system, and, and we'll let you know, you know, exactly what he sees is how much funding is available. Um, I'm not too familiar, yeah, if there's multiple, uh, 
you know, if, if more than one parent has, I, I, I imagine you can use it all, but I, I'll leave that to Jason to, to clarify, because I'm not totally sure. But yeah, we do have students that use VA funding um, each, each year, each semester, so that um, he can definitely look into that for you. Um, super. Any, any other questions, or is this just the best, most thorough <laughs> A presentation uh you've ever you're very welcome uh you've ever attended um let me get to the next slide here just to uh so um like i think bobby posted the link too uh but so these are our informational webinars you've just attended the uh, uh uh, what, what did you attend? The Affordability and Financial Aid webinar. We also have our visa webinar, as I, I plugged a little bit earlier in the presentation. And then we also have Bobby's Why London webinar. If you haven't seen that, that's a great presentation too. And you can register for all of them uh, following that link. There's my email address right there, as well as the U.S. Admissions Office. Uh, I'm going to conclude the recording now. If you have any questions and want to hang out, certainly happy to answer for a few minutes. But if you are joining us in the future, from the future, thank you so much for watching this presentation and feel free to reach out if we can be of assistance.